Hello and welcome back to yet another GCSE revision lesson. Now with the Macbeth exam just two weeks away, you might be panicking just a little bit. You may have left all your revision till last minute, or perhaps you're drowning in notes and you're not entirely sure where to start and what to remember last minute prior to the upcoming exam. So as you can see behind me, what I did was I created the main context theme as well as quotes to remember for Macbeth if you are literally revising last, last minute and you're not entirely sure where to start and what to remember. So guys, if you forget everything else, make sure you remember these essential points. Let's begin firstly by going over the top three context points to remember for any Macbeth essay that you write. The first thing is always remember that Shakespeare's message was a warning to his audience not to violate divine right of kings because what that would do is it would disrupt the great chain of being. This is a cautionary tale whereby you have Macbeth who violates divine right of kings by killing King Duncan. This disrupts the natural order, causes chaos. And of course, remember that this is contextually reflecting how Shakespeare wants to tell people not to even think about overthrowing King James I. And of course, this is also can be tied to the gunpowder plot because Guy Fawkes tried to, however, his plan was foiled, okay? It was discovered and neutralized. The second context point to remember for Macbeth, if you forget, everything else, and this is especially in relation to Lady Macbeth and Lady Macduff, is to do with women's roles in Jacobean society at this time. Remember, Lady Macduff was the ideal woman. She sat at home, she looked after her son, she didn't know what was happening with her husband, right? Her husband Macduff didn't even consult her on anything that he did. He just disappeared and went off to England. That's a typical Jacobean woman. However, Lady Macbeth stands as a stark contrast to that. Lady Macbeth is ambitious. She stands up to her husband. She even questions his masculinity. This is not what a woman should do. Women at the time should not be ambitious and this led a lot of Jacobeans to see Lady Macbeth as supernatural because she's going against her nature as a woman and this led her to call her the fourth witch and of course her going crazy at the end could be the audience's way of basically saying actually she deserved it this is God's punishment to her for not following her nature as a woman. That's the second main context point to talk about and the final context point is of course to do with the supernatural. The witches start off the chain of events that happen that leads to the tragedy of of Macbeth. They're the ones that trigger his homartial, which is his ambition, his fatal flaw, and this leads him to have a series of mistakes, and this ultimately leads to his downfall. Now, the supernatural, in terms of, from Shakespeare's perspective, were agents of chaos that were not to be believed, that would cause chaos, that would cause problems in Scotland. And remember that King James the first was very superstitious. He even wrote a whole book called Demonology, talking about why you shouldn't trust the witches and how to spot them, okay? So remember that this is a really, really important context point. The Jacobean audience would have been very superstitious at the time. They would have taken on Banquist's views that we shouldn't trust the instruments of darkness. Hence, Macbeth makes a massive mistake by listening to the witches and letting that guide his actions, which leads him to kill King Duncan. Those are the three context points. If you forget everything, make sure you memorize and commit those points to memory. You can use those three context points in any Macbeth essay that you get in your upcoming exams. Now let's go into themes. The first theme is of course the theme of ambition. This is Macbeth's Hamartia. Make sure you use the word Hamartia. This is a word from Aristotle, the Greek philosopher who basically said any tragedy must have a high-born hero who has a fatal flaw that leads to his downfall. In Macbeth's case, his fatal flaw is as ambition. And remember that Shakespeare saw ambition as a bad thing because it disrupted the great chain of being. That's the first theme you can write about. The second theme, of course, is the supernatural. And this actually is very closely tied to the third theme of guilt. Remember the supernatural, similar to the point to do with context, the supernatural must never be trusted. They are agents of chaos. They speak in equivocations and riddles in order to misguide Macbeth. Of course, this, as I mentioned, ties into the theme of guilt. Both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth receive supernatural hallucinations, which represent their guilt. Macbeth sees the floating dagger. He also sees the dead ghost of Banquo. Lady Macbeth sees the spots of blood on her hands, 
both of which represent guilt. And this is used as a theme by Shakespeare to illustrate how really remorseful they feel. The next theme is of course appearances and reality and especially this is shown through Lady Macbeth's character. She says, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. What does that mean? She basically tells Macbeth, use an appearance of looking like a good person in order to misguide others. Of course, the reality of who you are must be covered. And of course, both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth manipulate reality through using appearances. And this misguides most of the characters. The only person that doesn't believe them is Macduff and he survives. The final theme is that of loyalty and betrayal. Macbeth is strongest when he is loyal to King Duncan. The play starts off by him being very loyal. This is when he's really strong. This is when we admire him. However, once he betrays King Duncan, he also betrays Banquo as well as Macduff, right? By having his family killed, this weakens his character. Of course, Lady Macbeth is presented as an inherently corrupt and weak character. She focuses on betraying all of these different people. She triggers Macbeth to betray others. However, she later feels very remorseful when she sees the spots of her blood of blood on her hands and she wishes she were loyal. Those are the five top themes to remember for Macbeth. Now, if you are struggling for quotations, I know there's lots of different characters that you need to remember. You need to remember obviously what these characters represent. Firstly, Macbeth, Lady Macbeth, but don't forget you've got the witches, you've got Banquo, you've got King Duncan, all of those characters and of course also Macduff you need to know a quotation for. So here's a list of 10 quotes that cover all of the main characters that you need to be familiar with. The first quotation, if you forget everything else, make sure you remember what the witches say. They say fair is foul and foul is fair. In other words, they say this in the beginning of the play in act one, scene one, to basically show that they're about to topple and to transform the natural order. They're about to bring chaos. The first way in until the hurly burly is done, i.e. Scotland is at peace, before they use Macbeth to topple the natural order. That's the first quotation. This illustrates, of course, from the start that the witches are agents of chaos. The second quotation is Lady Macbeth showing how corrupt, how ambitious she is. She says, come your spirits, ellipsis, unsex me here. Here she wants to be changed. She sees her gender, her femininity as a really massive annoyance and she wants the spirits to change her, to remove her femininity from her. Of course, what this indicates from a really early stage is that firstly, she's very corrupted by ambition, but secondly, she also is somebody that is going to use Macbeth, manipulate him in order to attain what she wants. The third quotation is of course Macbeth, who considers his vaulting ambition. Remember that this is now where we can see this, the seeds of ambition are firmly planted in his mind. He wants to be king and he wonders, he weighs up what him and Macbeth are hatching in terms of their plot. He's thinking, should I kill the king? Should I not? I do have vaulting ambition, but I'm not sure if I can handle kingship. The fourth quotation is to do with King Duncan, how gullible he is and how loyal he is to Macbeth and Lady Macbeth and equally how he trusts appearances too much and this is what Macbeth and Lady Macbeth use against him. He says that there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. What this is illustrating is that King Duncan finds it very difficult to tell what people are thinking just by looking at their face. That's why he was betrayed by the first Thane of Cordor, MacDonald, and then also betrayed by the second Thane of Cordor who killed him, Macbeth. The next quotation is, of course, Lady Macbeth, who plays with the idea of appearances of reality. She tells Macbeth to look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent. The juxtaposition of flower and serpent, she basically says, Macbeth, use your appearance to misguide and mislead others. The next quotation, the sixth, is Macbeth's first hallucination. He asks, is this a dagger? Rhetorical question. He is feeling so guilty about kill killing King Duncan, he hallucinates. But, however, he still goes ahead and kills him. The next quotation is, of course, Banquo. We see initially Banquo and Macbeth are very close. However, once the witch has given him the prophecies and then a series of, and a chain of events happen where Macbeth suddenly goes from being Thane of Glums to Thane of Cordor, then King, Banquo starts doubting, is this guy, did he do something to make this happen? Because he asks and he says, he's listening here, thou hast it now, King Cordor Glams, or oh, Glamis, if you want to say Glamis, okay? This quotation is really powerful because we can see here that Banquo is starting to doubt Macbeth, but he does it too late because Macbeth has him murdered. The next quotation is, of course, Macduff. We can see that Macduff never, ever strays from divine right of kings and respecting lineage, okay? He respects Malcolm's position after King Duncan dies because even if he kills Macbeth, he hands the crown back to Macduff or Malcolm, okay? So this is Macduff, hands the crown back to Malcolm. And we can see that he really respects the king because once he discovers his dead body, he says that it's a most sacrilegious murder. He's horrified. 
The next quotation, so this is quote number nine, is of course Macbeth's second hallucination, which represents his guilt. He sees Banquo's dead ghost and he tells him, never shake that gory locks. We can see here that Macbeth is overcome with paranoia. And the final quotation, if you forget, Everything else is the quote that contrasts how Lady Macbeth is quite strong, very ambitious at the beginning to at the end. She's weak, she's overcome with remorse and she's very penitent, she's very guilty. She says, out damn spot. This is her supernatural hallucination where she sees spots of blood on her hands and she wants to reverse all the terrible actions that she has influenced Macbeth to do. But of course, she is beyond redemption and she ends up committing suicide. So that's really it when it comes to the main context theme and quotes to remember if you are studying with Beth at a last minute basis. Now guys, be aware that I have a very upcoming, uh, rather I have a very exciting upcoming collaboration with Mr. Sally's this Sunday where we're going to be going over our Macbeth predictions so do make sure you look out for that video where I'm going to be going over my predictions for the upcoming Macbeth exams this year and Mr. Sally's is also going to be presenting his predictions for the upcoming Macbeth exams. Thanks so much for listening.